Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, we really appreciate the, the fact that uh, you've all showed up. We originally had hoped to have a very small scale event over at uh, SIPA, but we're very gratified that um, you all decided to learn about how to make a successful nation. As I was talking to Darren a little bit earlier, being positive is better than being uh, negative. Now, first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to thank the sponsor. So this is a this pro program was set up about a year ago. We were trying to set up um, interesting activities in um, at Columbia, and it's sponsored. It's sort of an example of the interdisciplinary work we do here. It's sponsored by SIPA and the Center for uh, Global Economic Governance, which is directed by Jens Feiner, who is here. It's also sponsored by the Columbia Law School, the Kauffman Foundation, and the Center for Contract and Economic Organization, which is directed by Bob Scott, who's here in the end. And it's also supported by the Department of Economics Columbia, Columbia, at Columbia and the Program for Economic Research directed by Ricardo Rice, who should be here somewhere. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks in particular to the fantastic organization we have here, Elizabeth Boyland, David Coughlin, Julia, Juliana Capaldi, Kitty Dare, and Geraldine McAllister did a fantastic job getting this all together and we really didn't have to worry about any of the organizational details. Anything that works is, is uh, th their responsibility. Anything that doesn't work is my responsibility. Uh, now, we, um, what I'd like to do is I'll give you a quick plan of what we're going to do. I'll just do a little bit of an introduction. I'll introduce the speakers. Then we're going to do two rounds of speakers. So the first, each speaker will first talk a little bit but what they see is sort of an essential or important ingredient to making a, a nation work. Then we'll do a second round where speakers will engage with each other. And then we'll have a third round where we'll, we'll invite you, the audience, to ask them questions about things that you feel are important. And at the end, we'll have a, a reception at the back where you have some further time to discuss with yourselves or discuss with the speakers. Um, the, let me start with the introduction. The first, uh, I'll go from left to right. Everything's alphabetical. So this, was, this uh, seating order was not a planned seating order, but an alphabetical seating order. The starting point, as you can see, is my copy of Why Nations Fail. And you notice I've read it very carefully. Um, this is written by Darren Asamuglu and Jim Robinson. Darren Asamuglu, who's our first speaker here on the right, on, on, my, on your left, my right, is the Elizabeth and James Kilm Professor of Economics at MIT. He's a John Bates Clark Medal winner, and as many of you probably know, the John Bates Clark Medal winner is your first prize, and your second prize is a Nobel Prize. He's also the author of Why Nations Fail and many other books. Uh, it was, Why Nations Fail was the International Affairs Book of the Year. Um, he's also written The Economic Origins of Dictation and Democracy and Induction to Modern Economic Growth, and, and two of these that were done with Jim Robinson. I can't help mentioning as well that uh, Jim Malcolmson, who's a very stern co-author of mine, was on uh, Darren's PhD committee, and, and, and Jim said that Asimugul's thesis consists of seven substantive chapters, each of which formed a paper in its own right. Each of these chapters was itself of very high quality. Indeed, I would consider even the weakest three of them to have been more than sufficient for the award of a PhD. So he was just a little bit shy, one paper short of two PhDs at the time he graduated from the LSE. Actually, I'll ask Darren if you don't mind signing the book for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> He'll sign it, yeah. He didn't like my review that I wrote about his book last year, so, but anyway. The second speaker on the left is Gene Emsinger, who's the Eddie and Lou Wasser, Wasserman Professor of Social Science at the California Institute of Technology and past president of the Society for Economic Anthropology. Her work on Africa includes economic anthropology and the making of a, of a market, the institutional transformation of an African society, and the, uh, this book. And it also, uh, and recently an edited book by, with Joel Henrik, Experimenting with Social Norms, Fairness, and Punishment in Cross-Cultural Perspective, which is another, another great book. I advise you to get this book and do as I'm going to do. Please sign. <laughs> All right. Uh, Riki, unfortunately, Riki's also written a book. So in fact, one of the ways you get here is you have to write a book. Her book is, is in German. I don't actually have a copy. It's being translated by Yale University Press. And so as soon as I, I get a copy, I will definitely ask her to sign it as well. <laughs> Ulrike Malmedier is the Edward J. and Molly Ulner Professor of Finance at the Haas School of Business and Professor of Economics, Department of Economics at UC Berkeley, with a PhD in Business Economics from Harvard and a PhD in Law from the University of Bonn, which won the prize of the President of the Italian Republic. And she was also recently the winner of the Fisher Back Prize in Finance. Before her work, behavioral economics, economic finance used, used to be applied only to individual investors and individual consumers, and the notion that top managers, firms, and institutions could exhibit behavioral biases was really foreign. She started the field of behavioral corporate finance and behavioral corporate governance with her work on managerial overconfidence with Jeff Taft. She's also an expert on Roman law and has a book forthcoming with Yale University Press, The Origins of the Corporation. 
And in some sense, as you can see, what we're doing is we're going to cover all aspects of building a major, a major uh, a successful firm, a successful firm and nation. The, la the last person on, on your right is Robert Scott, the Alfred McCormick Professor of Law and Director of the Center on Contract and Economic Organization at Columbia University. He was Dean of the Virginia Law School for 10 years, served as President of the American Law and Deans Association from 1999 to 2001, and is a member of the um, American Academy of Arts and Science. He's one of the world's leading experts on contract law and is the author of Foundations of Commercial Law, Contract Law and Theory and the Limits of Leviathan, Contract Theory and the Enforcement of International Law. With, and with Milu Gulati, he's done the three and a half minute transaction, Boiler Plate and the Limits of Contract Design. This is this book here, another fantastic book. Uh, he, his work with Charlie Getz has influenced law in the United States. And, and, and most law professors like to get cited, but his work was actually used by judges to change uh, Delaware law. And so he's, he's been a major influence in U.S. law. And I will also ask him to sign his book as well. I thought I already signed it for you. But you can do it again. Oh. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to sort of start, I'm going to start over here. One of the things about Columbia is you know, you just open up the paper any day. U.S. fights collapse in Middle East talk. This is this morning's paper. What I didn't have to worry about is I knew when I opened up today's paper, there'd be some issue of relevance that these experts could talk about. Justices 5-4 void key spending caps on political recesses. Power search for donors. Uh, crime inquiry set to open in Citigroup. So these are all governance issues. If we go to inside pages, we have here display resilience of Afghanistan and prepare to vote. And so Darren will talk a little bit about democracy. So in some sense, what I want to do today is we're going to talk about the problems of building a successful nation. And, in this, and, a, and a successful society or nation is, is a bunch of complementary units. So in a sense, we often listen to people who say, I have the solution for success. If you think of a transistor radio, you remove any single component, the radio doesn't work. So in a sense, what I want to do, the reason we call is why, how, why nations succeed, is to ask what are the various components that we can put together and build up a nation that actually works. Each one of these individuals are sort of world experts in their field. We have, you know, Deron has done work on political economy and economics. Gene has worked on, in Africa with the Orma and understanding how individuals behave in, in smaller groups. And Uriki's worked on behavioral, behavioral finance and Bob's worked on, on the legal system. Each of these are sort of impo important components to a functioning system. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a, a, a discussion and each individual will talk a little bit about, about their work and then we'll come back and then ask what is sort of the, the, how these uh, pieces of work work together. So Deron, I'm going to start with you. In your book with Jim Robinson on why nations fail, you focus on the role of exclu uh, exclusive, inclusive institutions and exclu extractive institutions to explain the failure of nations. The political coast theorem would suggest that nations would discover the value of inclusive institutions. Can you discuss what you mean by inclusive versus extractive institutions, and what are the factors in terms of the success of inclusive institutions? Thanks, Bentley. Uh, thanks. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to kick this off. Uh, so uh, Jim and I. Uh, have tried to develop a framework for thinking about a wide variety of uh, different trajectories that have taken place in economic development over the last several hundreds of years. And, and, and the emphasis we, we put is, is on institutions. But in particular, it's the feedbacks between economic and political institutions. We talk of inclusive and extractive economic institutions. And what we mean by that is that inclusive economic institutions are essentially what we normally assume in economic textbooks. When you go to a standard a, you know, economic class on principles of economics or microeconomics, we normally assume markets work, people can write contracts, there is going to be free entry, uh, people can allocate themselves across occupations according to their skills, talents, comparative advantage, and so on. So broadly speaking, those are economic institutions, both formal and informal, that enable people to invest, innovate, and benefit from, these ben uh, from the fruits of their investments and innovation, and provide a relatively equal level playing field so that people are not unduly disadvantaged in their choice of occupation or investment or innovation. But most of the institutions around the world actually are not like what we assume in our economic textbooks. In most societies, property rights are very insecure. People cannot write contracts. 
contracts have a lot of uh, loose elements in them that are going to be decided by biased legal systems. And most importantly, we live in a world of tilted playing field in which some people are advantaged by entry barriers, by specific regulations that don't let people enter into occupations because of their skin color, ethnicity, or socioeconomic background. And all of these things create an environment in which people are not going to be able to use their skills and talents and ideas to advance economically. But from the point of view of the book, what's really important, at least my reading of, 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 of the book and of the, these issues, is that these economic institutions are supported by political institutions. Because it's very difficult to have a situation in which there is a level playing field and politicians or powerful individuals are not able to violate other people's property rights if political power is very much concentrated in the hands of a few people and can be exercised without checks and balances. Similarly, extractive economic institutions live much more comfortably with extractive political institutions where political power is very much concentrated in the same way that economic power is concentrated through the tilted playing field. And it's the interplay of economics and politics that really makes our framework work, and in our opinion, it's the, really the essence of understanding why is it that some societies are unable to economically develop and fail economically and fail socially and fail politically. And just to give you an example, since uh, Bentley mentioned you, know, you could turn to the pages of the newspaper and find topics that are going to be relevant for what we're talking about, think of Ukraine. If you want to understand you know, Ukraine is an economic failure, and I think there is no doubt that Ukraine has been an economic failure since the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. If you compare it, say, for example, to Poland, which you know, geographically, ethnically, uh, in terms of economic background, is very similar to Ukraine. They have been on entirely different trajectories, and Poland is now more than twice the income per capita level of Ukraine. To understand that, you have to think about Ukraine's economic institutions, but you cannot understand these economic institutions without thinking about the political institutions, how politicians have been able to you know, exercise power without having any accountability to the people of their country, and how they have been able to uh, channel funds to themselves, to, uh, to their cronies, and then how they have been able to maintain a cozy relationship with Russia at the expense of economic reform in the country. Now, in this context, we can ask the question uh, that Bentley sort of came to, which is, why don't we have an equivalent of a cost theorem here? Why can't we say that a country like Ukraine uh, would find a set of economic institutions that would have made it grow just like Poland did, and then would have redistributed these gains in some way that would have made everybody in the society better off? And I think the reason for that is both economic and, politic, uh, economic and political, and that's why thinking about the economics and, uh, econo economic and political institutions is very important. First of all, when you sort of open up the economy and we uh, increase the security of property rights, increase uh, the ability of new businesses, new people to enter into new areas and, and compete, you are creating economic rents, but those rents are naturally going to be captured by the new people, not by the existing elites. So if you're part of the existing elite, you're not going to directly benefit from it. There might be some transfers. Perhaps you know, we can design a system where Yanukovych and his uh, cronies could have been the beneficiaries of Ukraine's economic growth. But even that is not going to be very easy to implement if you think about it. Why not? Well, the reason is what we call, what Jim, Jim and I call, the fear of political uh, creative destruction. And what we mean by that is that once you start a process of fundamental economic reform where the economic dynamics of the society and together with it the social dynamics start changing, that's also going to start destabilizing the political system. It's very difficult to imagine a fundamental transformation of an economy like Ukraine or any other economy that you pick from Egypt to Uzbekistan to Mexico to uh, uh, Guatemala where this sort of economic transformation is necessary, that is not naturally going to go hand in hand with a change in the distribution of political power in society. <coughs> and those who were sitting atop of these extractive political institutions are going to be destabilized, are going to start losing their political power. And in fact, you know, it's not a surprise that many people who are running their economies, their societies in a dictatorial manner, are most afraid of the challenges to the stability that come either from the economic or the political 
domain because both of these sorts of things are going to create this sort of instability and any sort of promises that a society could theoretically make saying let's adopt the best set of institutions for economic growth and we'll redistribute the gains to make everybody better off, that won't even be worth the paper it's written on. So in some sense, going back to the original framework, the reason why you don't have a political cost theorem and the reason why the world that we live in is marred by inefficiencies that are very deep and are so deep that are the causes, in our opinion, of the 40-fold income differences that you see around us across countries is because economics and politics work in a very integrated manner and you cannot piecemeal design uh, arrangements that are going to be part of improving without taking into account what their political implications are going to be. And I'll stop there here, and we'll pick it up again in the second round. Gene, you talk about you've worked in Africa, the cradle of human humans. What do you think? <laughs> well, I want to begin by saying that as somebody who has spent my career uh, in the case study mode, I'm extremely gratified to see a book such as uh, Daron and Jim's which is founded on a meta-analysis of case studies, it's tremendously gratifying to see that work used to such good effect. Um, what I'd like to talk about right now, uh, in terms of missing pieces for success of nations, is social norms and the relationship between social norms and socioeconomic complexity. It's another fancy word for institutions. I've been involved for uh, over a decade with a project where we attempted to measure what we call pro-social norms, that's the good kind, uh, and their relationship to the development of markets and increasing socio-political complexity, which were more or less indistinguishable because they're very strongly correlated. What I'm talking about here with pro-social norms is um, internalizations of a preference for fairness, cooperation, which leads to effective collective action, um, trust, and also the willingness to pay a price to punish others for not um, um, abiding by the social norms. We did this with economic experiments. We ran dictator games, ultimatum games, trust games, um, and third-party punishment games, and a variety of others around the world, small-scale societies around the world. And when I say small-scale, I mean hunters and gatherers, slash and burn agriculturalists, pastoralists, farmers of multiple sorts, urban population in Accra, Ghana, and rural Missouri, the most exotic community in which I've ever worked. <coughs> um, so we, we had a world sample, and I'm going to talk about two of our findings from this project. Uh, the most surprising to many people in some ways was that the correlation between fair-mindedness in offers that people gave, for example, in the dictator game where you're just dividing the money, one day's wage controlled across societies, people in the smallest scale societies with the least political complexity, band level societies like hunters and gatherers, slash and burn agriculturalists, gave the smallest amount to their anonymous partner. Those in highly developed market societies, that would be rural Missouri, Accra, Ghana, gave the most. In other words, they, they were more fair-minded, and this is the way they talked about the fact that they gave um, well over 40 percent, and in rural Missouri, um, close to 50 percent. So <clears throat> why would this be the case? We believe that there is an iterative effect going on between the development of norms for pro-social behavior and the development of markets and socio-political complexity. In a very small-scale society with face-to-face -face dyadic relationships, there's the ability to punish people directly, but it doesn't translate very well, and nor do people in such societies have a great deal of experience in anonymous economic market exchange. In highly complex market societies, the enforcement and monitoring of contracts can never be perfect. It's much more efficient for the sake of the economy, and the system works much better if people have internalized some sense of fair dealing and abiding by the rules. Second finding that I want to talk about um, is 
what happens regarding punishment behavior? And the experiment that drives this home most clearly is what's called the third party punishment game. In this experiment, you've got two people playing a, a dictator game and then a third party endowed with a stake from which they can pay money to punish player number one for having engaged in what they perceive to be unfair behavior toward player number two. So they were not an injured party, but they're acting as a sort of adjudicatory party in the third person. And what we find here is that there's a strong correlation with community size. The larger the size of the community people live in, the more inclined they are to be heavy punishers of those who violate this social norm of fair-mindedness. Um, again, in face-to-face <clears throat> -face, um, societies, um, people are living in much smaller communities and they're able to solve these conflict problems either by personal dyadic relationships or by moving away because many of these societies are nomadic. Once one settles down into a community, um, communities grow to a larger size because they can, they're now based on agriculture if not industrialization, but people can no longer solve their problems in face-to-face -face relationships. They're involved in some anonymous exchanges and merely getting along in such societies when you can no longer move away requires the development of more complex um, institutions for conflict resolution. And that's what we found um, in the course of our research. Now, the mechanisms by which we see this coevolution of the pro-social norms um, and the institutions, um, we believe is something akin to natural selection, such that more successful societies outcompete other societies. And you may immediately think of military expansion, they're more successful, they've got resources, a better military. Yes, that certainly undoubtedly happens. It happens also through slave raiding, but it also happens by attracting followers. It also happens completely peacefully by attracting women, for example, by being able to pay higher bride wealth. Um, and we see this commonly in Africa. And it also, of course, happens by diffusion. People copy those who are particularly successful. Um, in Africa and in many other parts of the world, these systems were aborted. When I say systems, I mean this give and take process. Not, of course, always moving in the same direction, sometimes falling backward, but this iterative process of social norms evolving together with higher socio-political complexity was aborted by slavery first and also by colonialism. A top-down imposition of state, which is what occurred, for example, in Africa as these boundaries were carved up in Europe, meant that formal laws were put on the books, but the social norms that are required in order for people to grant legitimacy to the state and in order for them to abide by these laws that are on the books did not necessarily exist. And this is one of the missing social pieces for the success of nations. That's great. So Ricky, how does this fit into running a major modern corporation? <laughs> um, big question. Um, so I, I gather from you mentioning my, my, my other PhD in Roman law and the word evolution um, that um, I, I think I, I, I might be able to provide a little bit of background, a little bit of um, very ancient background, which got me interested into these questions. So, so when, when I was still an aspiring uh, legal scholar uh, a decade ago, didn't work out so well, I, wrote, I worked a lot in uh, Roman law, and um, I'm a big fan of Roman law. I think the Romans did fantastic work thinking about systems of contracts, levels of liabilities, lots of very important uh, <coughs> rules which still influence not only civil law but also common law systems actually and in fact I think any law school student should study Roman law. However, um, when uh, the topic I really got interested in uh, was the question when, you know, also doing economics, when the Roman uh, economy started to grow, how they relied on uh, the interaction of entrepreneurs and uh, 
uh, when and under which circumstances uh, companies, uh, corporations, and quotation mark uh, started to grow. And so what, what I discovered then is um, when we think today of Roman law, we think of the classic Roman law. It's written down in the Justinian Code from 500 AD, and you know it reports basically you know legal rules that were developed 200, 300 years earlier than that. Something really interesting is that actually the time when Rome was really successful in um, having companies grow, which had a little bit of a corporate feature, they had shares, they found ways to kind of limit liability, was actually the Roman Republic, the, the BC times. And um, that was a time when this, um, these great Roman law inventions, if I may call them that, hadn't actually come into existence yet. And so, so what... Um, um, how this came about is, um, um, uh, is that at the time, the Roman government wasn't very large. There was a system of people elected for two years, four years, and then rotating out again. There was no stable bureaucracy. And um, pretty much the Roman government couldn't afford to build a big bureaucracy, which would also take off economic activities, which are traditionally, also in modern times to some extent, but definitely traditionally, are done by government. So tax collection is the famous one, but even using natural resources, building streets, building temples, um, lots of examples are, are along those lines. And so they couldn't do that. They had a growing empire, however. What did they do? Well, they started doing auctions on the Forum Romanum, and entrepreneurs came and bid for these jobs. And since these businesses grew larger and larger, but no legal environment was there to really handle that, well, they found ways to handle it. There was political support for making it possible to also deal with taxes in the provinces and also use these wonderful mines in some other provinces. And de facto, a type of company formed, the Societas Publicanorum, the Society of Tax Collector or people dealing with, with, with public needs, uh, which had many very um, modern features. So, so that was very interesting, but it was also a little bit of a shock. It was a particular shock to discover that when Roman law developed and reached its height, the classic Roman law period, these um, organizations started to disappear. And what happened is that at the time, a Roman emperor system started to establish, slowly evolving from, from the Republic. And this emperor, you know, I, I think there are many different hypotheses out there, but one way I tend to think about it, didn't like to have other big, big wicks around him and was kind of incorporating more and more of these activities into activities run uh, by, the, by the state, by the, by the government. So, so, so why is this story interesting? I guess it's just one case. I've been mean, talking about the importance of case studies. I th see it just as one case study which um, indicates that when um, we, we think that we can ensure the success of nations by giving them certain ingredients. And in this case, I'm talking about kind of a legal system, which, I, which is important, I certainly don't want to deny, and I still believe in good Roman law, but if we think, we, if, we, if we implement that, um, then we can automatically predict kind of a correlation of also on the economic side, economic growth side, if we have property rights, contracting systems, et cetera, in place, maybe we ought to be a little careful. And so there are many more case studies, and a lot of them are in Deron's book. Um, um, you know, a lot of the modern case studies, you might even think of you know, China, where maybe the legal system hasn't reached the state we would expect to see, given the economic activities, but nevertheless, some economic activities in the direction of slightly in the direction of capitalism is, is starting with, uh, with public support. Or if you think about South Korea, if we think um, about the failures in Mexico after the, the Mexican miracle, I think there are lots of examples which kind of point in this direction. And so what's just neat about the Roman example is that was a case where, you know, oftentimes you have the political uh, uh, development and the um, legal development kind of going the same direction. The legal system makes progress. And the political system makes also progress towards a more, you know, um, towards democracy or um, openness toward market-based economies and kind of disentangling effects is hard. And so what's cool about uh, the Romans is they ha used to have, a, you know, a republic um, with elections, um, limited who could vote, but, you know, still, and um, a no good legal system and found very modern ways of dealing with the economic activities. Then... Um, however, the political system, in some sense, you may say, regressed. 
with you know one person assuming a lot of the power, um, and the, um, the legal system evolved forward, but economic system also regressed. So I think it's just kind of one cautionary <laughs> tale um, about you know uh, uh, about this notion that you can just take you know a legal s system and then kind of this would be the foundation of economic development. Of course, I'm economist today. I want to be careful about hypothetical counterfactuals. Who knows what would have been during the Roman Republic had they had classic modern law and, and, and vice versa. But I think it is still an interesting case study. And it, it, it links to you know, what I work on these days as a behavioral um, finance person who, um, who thinks about how um, past experiences uh, culture, if you wish, or personal experience um, is something I'm also interested in, affects the way we, we act, we, we, the, the way we're willing to, to take risks. So, so a very a current example is financial crisis. If we, are, um, um, you know, if we have lived through the recent financial crisis, so our retirement savings disappear, or a particular young generation just entering the job market for the first time, earning money, putting it aside on a broadly diversified stock-based index as we recommend as finance professors and it poof went away, um, then to assume that you know, once you have re-established the same economic parameters, we give people the, their wealth back, we, you have re-established that you know, mortgage lending functions properly, you have kind of re-established the economic conditions under which you think people would um, behave rationally in terms of their savings behavior, I think you will be wrong. I think you will discover, and I've discovered that in my work, that there's a lasting impact of what you've lived through. If you've lived through the financial crisis, you will tend to shy away from stock market investment for the next 5, 10, 20 years. It will slowly revert, and only slowly you're going to go back to more diversified investing. So what I'm trying to say is that we have to put institutions, a system, incentives in the context of what a person and a nation has lived through. And in, in fact, the origin of this kind of interest, you know, me being German and my course on these projects, Stefan Nagel also being German, was indeed us wondering why Germans, you know, are so obsessed about inflation. And uh, talking about how I was looking in your newspaper before whether I could find a comment about Draghi uh, fighting deflationary tendencies. I'm sure the average blood pressure went up in Germany today and the number of heart attacks as well when the news came out. And so, so there's this notion that what a nation has experienced, where they come from, will fundamentally alter the way they're engaging with institutions, the way they're making choices personally, and then accumulating up also to an organizational level. So what I just said about experience effects and affecting, and I can measure it, whether or not you take a mortgage, and whether it's a fixed rate or variable rate mortgage, whether or not you invest in the stock market or just put everything on a barely any interest paying savings account, that does aggregate <laughs> up actually to institutional uh, decision making. So um, for example, um, in banks, um, banks having lived through that crisis are now very aware of the type of risk they faced in that current crisis. They've kind of formed some type of institutional memory which affects their type of risk taking. And you can take the last hundred years of bank data and take uh, various measures of risk and, and, and you can detect it in this data. And so, so I'm, I'm basically kind of suggesting here that by trying to answer this question, it's like how do we kind of ensure a successful nation, we're going to come up with comments about uh, the legal system, about institutions, um, about the type of institutions, and in some sense it's very obvious. Um, what I'm, all I'm saying here is we have to be very careful to uh, think about to what nation are we applying it, where are they coming from. Oh, well, Bob, you have a lot to work with now. <laughs> what do you think? Well, uh, Bentley, you gave me an assignment earlier, uh, uh, which was a, a bold one, and I've already learned from my fellow panelists, and I just want to reiterate, but as they have said, I'm delighted to be here, uh, what would be the elements of a successful modern uh, legal system uh, in 10 minutes or less. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me start with a truism, um, widely accepted in the academic uh, community, that a necessary condition for a successful modern legal system is uh, the effective protection of property and contract rights. 
The question is, what does that mean? And I think to start with an answer, one has to begin uh, uh, at the beginning with the essence of the institution of contract, something we don't talk about often in these discussions, and that is the essence of the making and keeping of promises. Interestingly, anthropologists have studied cultures large and small all over the world and discovered only one instance, a single instance, of a society that does not recognize the norm of promising as a commitment to a future action. Making promises are ubiquitous. Keeping promises when one comes to regret the future is the trick. And having a, the ability to enforce promises of intended future actions has this wonderful property of bringing the future uh, to the present, of allowing um, individuals and organizations uh, to plan. And these future actions are, after all, what economists call uh, investment. And without investment, we are told, uh, there can be uh, no growth. So the question then is, what, what institutions are required to support and facilitate this core human behavior that seems to be shared uh, all over the world? And I'm going to make a rather <coughs> bold and provocative claim just to get the discussion going. And that is that in order to succeed at conditions of success, individual transactors, people making promises one to the other, require a governance structure with two key elements. The first is a mechanism by which they can share information iteratively with each other. That's necessary if they're going to plan and invest. And secondly, a method of resolving disputes, which includes centrally some means of enforcing promises against a regretting promisor. Now, my colleagues here at Columbia, uh, Ron Gilson and, and Chuck Sable and I, have been, have been studying these um, governance structures in the contemporary environment for about five or six years now, uh, an environment characterized by rapid technological change, as we all know, and increasing levels of uncertainty, where parties, I think, face challenges that are uh, quite unique and quite different from those in earlier historical periods. And, and what we see uh, is uh, the evolution of a novel form of contracting behavior that exists in many different settings, supply chains, biochemical and biotechnical development, Silicon Valley transactions. Um, uh, it is uh, relatively ubiquitous. And it involves uh, the parties committing to collaborate without committing to do anything other than to collaborate on a project that they cannot define at the time of the promise and is entirely open-ended in terms of the outcome of the collaboration, other than the aspiration that by sharing information, they ultimately may reach a project that neither can successfully uh, define or combine or co accomplish on their own. A radically incomplete contract, uh, as a, an economist would say, and economic theory struggles to find an explanation for why these investments go forward. Uh, what we find uh, that this uh, new structure illustrates is that successful governance structures are not simply a function of formal legal institutions, what you typically think about, a uh, system of courts to decree who is responsible for what and a sheriff or two uh, in order to enforce uh, those decrees. There are, in fact, uh, I would argue, uh, three key variables that contribute to success in any given environment. And in any given environment, these variables can function either as complements uh, or as substitutes. The claim would be that the presence of all three drives most successful modern legal systems. So the first element is rel relatively straightforward, uh, and that is a formal public system for coercively enforcing those promises that are the product of a bargain for uh, exchange. The reality is that the state owns the monopoly on uh, coercion, and as the monopolist uh, requires uh, uh, its power ultimately for uh, enforcement. Courts, therefore, as the embodiment of that coercive power, are the first and probably essential element uh, in, a, in a successful uh, system. 
And a lot has been written on what constitutes effective courts. Uh, at least three elements uh, stand out above all the others, an independent judiciary, quality judges, and perhaps most importantly of all, a system of published rules and opinions which together form a body of legal precedent, which we usually uh, uh, speak of when we're talking about the rule of law. The critical value here is that the truth is most parties do not litigate their disputes. Most parties don't seek coercive enforcement. Most parties bargain in the shadow of the law, and it's the existence of this structure which is backed by uh, the exercise of power that is uh, successful. Interestingly, in the modern global world, it turns out that it's no longer absolutely necessary that every nation have its own system of effective courts, because today parties can borrow courts. Uh, under the Hague Choice of Courts uh, Convention, uh, for example, uh, a state only need to ratify the treaty under which member states commit that they will honor the choice of court uh, chosen by parties in their private uh, agreement. Even more interestingly, although clearly aspirational at this point, is that these kinds of choice of court agreements in which you borrow uh, New York courts or London courts, for example, don't have to be limited to large transactional, uh, 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 international uh, transactions among large international players. They could actually be utilized potentially by a small scale domestic uh, transactors uh, as well because there are proposals now uh, 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 being uh, at least tried in an experimental way for virtual courts in which they would have availability for anyone who chose, let's say, um, uh, the New York Commercial Court to resolve their private dispute. So you could imagine a buyer and seller in Bangalore uh, agreeing to uh, litigate their disputes through the uh, system of a New York Commercial Court, never having to leave uh, the boundaries of Karnataka. Uh, there's a second element uh, that uh, is necessary for, uh, I think, a completely successful modern legal system, and that is there has to be a, a, a second formal element, but in this case not public but private, and that is uh, third-party adjudication typically through the form of arbitration. And what arbitration does is it enhances substantially in today's world the potency of enforcement. Uh, the New York uh, Arbitration Convention, as many of you know, has been ratified by 146 of the 193 member nations of the United Nations General Assembly. And by that uh, treaty, uh, arbitration awards are enforceable uh, by and in any member state. Arbitration also offers this complementary characteristic that courts often do not. Uh, you get expertise, or at least you can ask for and secure expert arbitrators you can also uh, secure customized procedures in which you can accelerate and speed the process by uh, limiting the uh, way in which the process is conducted uh, and uh, that way uh, often offers a speedier resolution. Now notice that while arbitration can complement effective courts, it is not uh, uh, capable of operating as a complete uh, substitute and that's because arbitration has one significant limitation, and that is it can't bind uh, easily third parties. So that if, in fact, you're, enter, you're considering uh, or trying to resolve uh, important property rights disputes that need to bind a whole uh, population of, of individuals in intellectual property matters, for example, uh, obviously you're going to need uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, court to be able to issue the appropriate uh, injunction. There is, however, a third uh, element often overlooked, although our panelists recognize it, I think, well, and that is entirely informal. Uh, uh, the uh, enforcement of promises through self-enforcement, what uh, economists typically call relational contracting. And the, you know it, that form of enforcement, as Jean mentioned, is easy to observe uh, in tightly knit homogeneous societies where you have strong shared cultural norms parties are prepared to uh, both reward generosity uh, and also punish uh, uh, selfishness. And um, uh, we have many examples just a few blocks south of us in midtown Manhattan. Diamond merchants today traded probably quarter of a million to a million dollars of diamonds, the most 
portable asset probably in the world with no formal mechanism uh, other than uh, their own uh, cultural values shared by their word and the threat of exclusion should someone violate uh, their uh, uh, promises. It's true that self-enforcement, when it works, is both cheaper and better than uh, formal enforcement. Uh, uh, it, however, also is not a complete substitute because in end game, bet the ranch circumstances, it's going to break down. And also in very complex transactions, the problem is that uh, uh, the complexity of a transaction reduces a party's <coughs> visibility of uh, understanding and properly characterizing uh, the behaviors of the counterparty. And in that case, uh, 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 a successful system, again, requires us to recur to some form of a referee. A basketball game runs too quickly and too complexly for parties to call fouls themselves. Those kinds of transactions similarly require a third-party referee as well. But I want to finish with the key issue, which I think is critical to the answer to the question of what builds success. And that is, again, to return to this a problem of or this issue of self-enforcement, but ask the tougher question. How does effective self-enforcement develop in a heterogeneous environment where parties don't share a cultural background, where they don't share normative priors? To what extent can one imagine that this mechanism can operate there? And that's the, uh, 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 the uh, data that we've been studying in our work here at uh, Columbia. Um, trying to find how it is that these collaborative mechanisms work. And what we find is that individual parties engaging in these collaborative contracting techniques create a governance regime of their own which effectively contextualizes their uh, environment. They enter into a formal commitment, often written with many uh, clauses, a formal commitment to do the two things I mentioned at the outset to engage in an iterative exchange of information, and then to establish internally a dispute resolution mechanism. Now, the dispute resolution mechanism that is the most common across the population of these collaborative contracts is, uh, is itself quite interesting. It typically involves a unanimity rule where each side takes a representative and they join together into a joint uh, decision-making body and each must agree on all critical decisions. The problem is what happens if there's dissent? And so the dispute resolution structure then has what you might call a kick upstairs mechanism. If they can't agree, it goes up to the next level of supervisors and they have to agree unanimously. If they don't agree, it goes up to the next, it goes up to the next, <laughs> it goes finally up to the CEOs. The important thing is you can imagine the disciplining power that that exacts on <laughs> dissent unless that dissent really has uh, potent uh, reasons uh, um, uh, to do so. So what does this collaboration produce? How is it that it works uh, to allow these parties to safely invest uh, when no formal structures uh, by way of enforcement are used? Uh, um, what we find is uh, that parties engaged in this activity learn two things about each other. First, they learn the capability of the counterparty to actually pursue the project in which they are engaged. Are you any good at doing what we need to do? And second, at the same time, they learn something about the counterparty's character. Do you have indeed the predisposition to cooperation and reciprocity that is essential to make this governance system work? Over time, what happens is that trust builds endogenously and the parties ultimately build a wall around each other because the cost of moving to any alternative partner obviously becomes larger and larger as the values uh, uh, that are inherent in dealing with the counterparty tend to grow. So I come up with a conclusion to answer Bentley's question. It has two parts to it. First, I think uh, and, and would argue that the interplay of all three of these uh, forces produces the most robust legal system in the modern world. But for states, uh, uh, the second point is, but for states that are still developing, the good news perhaps is that the ability to develop only one or two will provide fairly effective substitutes for what is missing. Well, thanks very much, Bob.
So what we'll do now is move to, uh, to round two and sort of ask people to comment on uh, what the others have said. And one, one, thing I would, one thing that's sort of common in my three panelists here, which, which is quite intriguing, is Jean actually described this evolution of social norms, and she described that the behavior at the individual level of individuals in different sites are quite different. That is, in dictators' games, they'll give different amounts of money. So that is, a, that is the peop, we often assume in economics that people are the same in all contexts, but here you have evidence that, in fact, their behavior varies as a function of the institutional design. What was particularly interesting was the fact that you're talking about this dynamics that somehow got arrested in the African context. And then uh, you were also discussing how, in the Roman context, we have this development of this beautiful law, but somehow it was missing the other side when the emperor stepped in. And then Bob was describing also beautiful law in another context. Now, what I would like to ask Deron is both of these, these three stories are dynamic. The past is very important. And I, I was wondering how, in a sense, you've described the, what we would call in economics a cross-section. That is, a successful nation has a bunch of in, ingredients, and unsuccessful ones have these poor institutions. Maybe we could look within the, a, a nation and ask, what are the sort of things that would give, get us on the path towards these better institutions, in your opinion? Uh, thank you, Bentley. So there's always a danger in uh, highly scripted uh, panels that you don't know whether it's going to gel. But one great advantage of being uh, together with these uh, three wonderful social scientists is that even if it's scripted, you learn a lot. So uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, I, I know uh, the work of uh, all three of them, but, uh, but hearing it in this context has been uh, really inspiring. And I want to actually, uh, rather than uh, directly respond to the script, I want to actually comment on, 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 on the issues that I think Bob, Ulrike, and, and Jean's uh, perspectives uh, present, and I'll come back to Bentley's question at the end uh, in that context. Because I think uh, the issues that are brought up here are, are central to many of the dynamics, uh, the, the many of the thinkings about dynamics of institutions and then really what we mean about institutions and what, what their roles are. And I think uh, starting from Bob's, uh, I think Bob gave a very, very complete and very uh, compelling account of what makes laws work. Uh, when is it that law enforcement really is effective? But on the other hand, I think it also highlights the way that I think about laws and, and perhaps uh, what their roles are and, and, and how perhaps it differs a little bit from uh, a lawyer's perspective. And I think uh, when we talk about institutions, and one of the reasons why we don't emphasize laws as the most important part of it is because laws are essentially what's in the books. So you can have laws that are very much on the extractive front in our inclusive extractive uh, axis. So if you think, for example, laws in slave societies or laws in South Africa apartheid, we can have exactly the discussion that Bob had about how a society will be able to enforce those laws and how much they are internalized, how much self-enforcement there is, uh, and, uh, and, and the ability of the state to sort of resolve the disputes around and in the center of these issues would all apply. But it wouldn't change the fact that these laws are deeply extractive and are actually not working for the benefit of the society at large, but only some part of it and are going to have, in my opinion, according to our research, uh, quite negative economic consequences. And I think the way to actually uh, make progress here, in some sense, is exactly what Ulrike emphasized, which is that you really have to think about the political foundations of law. Laws, just like every other human institution or norm, uh, is not devoid of politics. They are the result of some sort of conflict and struggle between different individuals, different groups, and have important implications about how authority, political power, and resources in society are distributed. And I think I love Ulrike's account of the Roman Republic and the transition to the empire, and I had read her paper in the past, but it's nice to hear it in this context. And it sort of brings up another issue, which I think political scientists generally call legitimacy. I think one different way of thinking about uh, Ulrike's account is that, uh, you know, whether a particular exercise of a, of a state 
in particular uh, in regards to how it r resolves dispute is, is legitimate. And I think that's something I, I, I've struggled a lot over the, over the years and I don't claim to understand it in the, partly because I think legitimacy is a very sort of uh, slippery notion. But, but I think there is something quite relevant for our understanding of institutions. And the way that I actually started realizing that there was a big hole in my own understanding of these issues was to think, thinking about a very, very simple empirical uh, uh, aspect of the data. Is that when you look at countries in the world and uh, either ranked by any measure of institutional quality or even income per capita, you'll see that those that are institutionally better and are more economically developed have a much larger share of their uh, of, of, of taxes in GDP. So it is the societies with better democratic institutions, better economic institutions in terms of property rights or, or other characteristics like that, that that raise higher taxes. So why would that actually be so? I mean, you might think, you might have thought ex ante that perhaps if you have an unchecked uh, kleptocrat, he would be able to grab a lot of resources from society. And it's not explained by the fact that you know some of the things that Mobutu steals from Zaire or Mugabe steals from uh, Zimbabwe are, are not in taxes. I think that's a sort of a small part of the story. I think a bigger part of the story is that it's only in societies where institutions are strong enough that individuals feel secure enough that they're going to have a say in how resources are utilized that they allow the government to penetrate economic relations, regulate economic relations. So this is what I tried to call in the past sort of consensually strong states. States become strong because they have the consent of society. And I think that's one way of thinking of trying to bring some of these issues back into, the, uh, into this inclusive economic uh, and, and versus extractive economic aspects. And I think that's also a way, it gives me sort of a way to think about the many important questions that, that Jean's uh, comments bring on the table. I mean, in addition to uh, her wonderful research on, 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 on understanding the internal social norms in, 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 in small scale societies, I think this is a fairly important uh, set of issues that remain unresolved and I don't, I don't fully know what's the best way forward, but I think there are some a few things that uh, that are sort of uh, worth mentioning here. And and I think uh, the first one is that I think it's a uh, it's it goes without saying that you, you're not going to have you know well functioning institutions without some sort of norms, both internal and external norms, that support them. You know, that's, that, that, that's a sine qua non. If people, if you know, you can have institutions but people don't respect them, they don't understand them, they are not internalized in some sense, they're not really going to have the same force. And, and I think uh, Jean is absolutely right that some sort of pro-social behavior is part of those institutions, uh, part of the functioning of those institutions. But I think after that, the picture gets much murkier in my mind. And I think remaining questions in my mind, and, and, and I would like to, I love to hear Jean's perspective on this, are related to such things as, you know, is there really one sort of pro-social norm? In other words, you know, you can, in the same way that societies can be inclusive, but only towards the people who are included. You know, you can have a nation state that's inclusive towards its citizens, but still, you know, like uh, the UK, you know, Britain did in the 19th century, quite extractive in its colonies. Perhaps pro-social behavior <coughs> also is only for the people who are viewed as social. So uh, people may be very pro-social, may support their group, but if their group is still a small part, only some part of society, and if those pro-social behaviors don't translate into respecting much more broad-based inclusive institutions, you know, what are, what is their implications going to be? The second set of questions that I think are really interesting, and, and I'm struggling uh, with them all the time, is sort of the, the feedbacks between norms and institutions. And I think, you know, uh, especially Jean has put the emphasis on internal norms, so how I actually internally think and internalize uh, how I should behave in certain anonymous transactions. You know, there's lots of interesting questions about how those internal norms are affected. You know, the way that a certain group of social scientists think of them, uh, you know, using, uh, and all, Jean has already hinted at them, 
using models adapted from evolutionary biology or, or cultural transmission, but, but it seems like, uh, you know, I, I don't have time to go into case studies or empirical evidence, but a range of evidence suggests that actually norms are more plastic than that. They change at a higher frequency than perhaps the uh, naive reading of, of evolutionary models would suggest. So, so I think that would be a really interesting set of ideas to investigate. So, you know, caricaturizing it, you know, one could think that exactly like Gene said, is that if you have a given set of social norms in society, as for example you had in Africa about how conflict resolution worked, who had respect, who had authority, and then you bring a set of laws that are totally in disconcert with them, that are totally dis uh, 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 conflicting with them, the laws are going to be uh, uh, ineffective. They're going to backfire. But on the other hand, that doesn't rule out the possibility that perhaps that if the distance between laws and norms was smaller, the laws would be able to start changing norms perhaps even very quickly. You know, Eisenhower thought that you could never change the minds and hearts of people in the South about the <coughs> issue of race relations with bullets and laws. But, but he was wrong. I think the South has been transformed by the civil rights movement and the federal uh, legislation that came with it. And that wasn't because uh, of a very simple evolutionary mechanism. I think it was a much more dynamic and from a day-to-day -day interactions that, that actually take place. So finally coming to Bentley's question, I think, you know, in the book we put a lot of emphasis on historical development, partly because history is where we have a lot of data, but also when you start thinking about institutions, it's really about the historical evolution. You cannot understand the extractive institutions you see around, that, around you without understanding the path-dependent change that they have taken from other uh, extractive institutions in history from certain critical junctures. But this is also probably one of the most incomplete parts of the world, because uh, of the book, of our framework, because there is still much more to be understood there. And I think the two topics that have really, I've tried to emphasize, but building on the emphasis of the other panelists, are, I think, a very important parts of that. One is that I think inclusive institutions really require this thing that I try to call perhaps not the best word, but consensually strong states. If I knew what it meant, I would use the word legitimacy. I think they have to build legitimacy. They have to go hand in hand in a process in which the capacity of the state increases at the same time that the accountability of the state, at least in certain activities, increases because that's what is going to enable that capacity to be exercised, and that's what's going to enable that capacity to be solidified without being undermined by people because people don't trust that capacity being used. And I think that really requires us to think much more deeply about these interactions between social norms on institutions. How is it that the social norms, for example, what we view as the rights that the citizens are able to protect against the state, uh, and, and how that evolves over time, and how their trust in certain constitutional or institutional features of society evolve together with the mature, uh, you know, process of the institutions becoming more mature are probably a very essential part of inclusive institutions being built over time. But I'll stop it here, since I don't want to go on longer, and then we'll have to get up later. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. I, I guess when I discussed this uh, panel with one of my colleagues, I was sort of worried that having two rounds uh, we go through things too quickly, but he said, well, when you have four academics, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and, and I think he was right. So what I, actually, what I would like to do is I would like to have the audience speak. So I'm going to go to Gene next, but also if people want to ask questions, if you just stand up at the mic, and what I'll do is after Gene, if there's anybody at the mic, I'll actually uh, let you ask, ask your question. So please, if you feel like asking a question, please stand up at the mic. So Gene, I'll go over to you, and I'll let you uh, respond. Um. I've said a lot about social norms, and let me just be very brief on Daron's question and say, I agree. <laughs> um, I want to, and I, I'll get into that maybe a little <coughs> bit more, but I, I want to um, go back to my roots here and talk about a case study. I think the case of Kenya fits Daron's book extremely well, the good bits and the bad bits. I don't mean good bits of the book. but the good bits of this process and the bad bits. And there's a little bit of a twist at the end. Um, so they talk a great deal in the book about political centralization being a condition for economic growth. In pre-colonial Kenya, 
there was not political centralization. Um, it was quite unusual, actually, across Africa. There were no chiefdoms and no archaic states in pre-colonial Africa. And of course, the colonialists created a state. It had 40 different ethnic groups. So there was nothing connecting those 40 different ethnic groups, a bit like a massively failed corporate merger. No shared culture, no shared institutions. Um, basically, uh, you know, different cultures, a, a big mess. No organic process to build up from the bottom. Political power became rapidly concentrated after independence. And as they suggest in the book, this led to rapid economic uh, concentration as well in first one ethnic group and then a second ethnic group. Um, so you had insecure property rights for most people, secure property rights for those in the favored groups. You had a great deal of land expropriation and I might add that is still going on. There are parts of Kenya, such as the place where I work, where the land grabbing is now totally out of control because it's one of the few parts of Kenya where people hold land in common. And historically in Kenya, that's always been the place people go grabbing. Um, you have bribable courts, bribable police, no level playing field. Uh, you, you've got the oligarchy situation, uh, post-colonialism, in other words, they made it even worse. However, that said, you do have lots of economic growth. Um, and they also make that point very effectively in the book. Um, the, the centers that are growing, that are dominated by two ethnic groups, are tremendously lucrative and productive. Of course, aided by the grabbing from the other areas as well. And as they suggest in the book, when the presidency is the source of all of this, it becomes extremely desirable to control the presidency, which ultimately leads to a lot of conflict. And indeed, prior to every presidential election in Kenya, there's been a great deal of conflict. In the 2007 presidential election, we had a somewhat different situation. The outsiders, according to virtually everybody in Kenya, actually won. But they were not allowed to take control of the government. So the election was stolen by the same old guys. Um, <clears throat> that is what precipitated the post-election violence of 2008, um, which, of course, made international headlines, and many of you are probably aware of it. And now we have what I call a special Daron moment. Um, the parts of the book that I love are the cases where there's suddenly a window of opportunity that people may take advantage of to turn the institutions in the right direction. And that's what happened coming out of, at least this is my analysis of what happened, coming out of this post-election violence. The old guard blinked. They were spooked. Kenya is unusual in Africa in that the very, they call them, by the way, the Mount Kenya Mafia, the very wealthy have substantial investments in country. As a consequence, they got scared. If the violence continued, if it got a lot worse, they could lose everything. And the reformers were very quick to capitalize on this and take advantage of the opportunity. One of them was even here following Obama around learning how to do grassroots organizing. These guys really pushed, they worked hard, and they managed to push through a new constitution in Kenya in 2010. This was no mean feat. In fact, it shocked even the reformers that they actually succeeded. This constitution has many good elements. Judicial reform, freedom of the press. That's not, of course, to say all of these things are actually being implemented. Nevertheless, they are there in the constitution and it makes some difference. But one of the big changes was political decentralization. They created 47 counties that had never existed before, together with infrastructures and revenue to be sent out to those countries. Now, in the book, uh, Daron talks a great deal about political inclusiveness. So, uh, 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 and the, the creation of these counties looks like political inclusiveness. We've got now resources going out far more broadly outside of uh, the central government. But again, 
oligarchy takes over. So now we have 48 centers eating, as they say in Kenya. So we've got governors eating, just like the big guy in Nairobi used to eat. So first they eat for themselves, then they engage in nepotism and patronage. And then there's something else that's going on now. And, and by the way, I'm reporting things that are literally coming to me over the telephone <laughs> uh, week by week. So this, this is pretty up to date. Um, in the villages, with the, what is left in these county governments, there is a push for every village to get their guys hired and every village to get somebody in their village to get one of the contracts that's being given out. But this doesn't, it does mean that there is a spreading of the crumbs that are left over. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're creating a competitive environment, which is what we would want for a real takeoff. The most qualified people are not the ones getting the jobs, even when you push for this greater uh, equitable distribution. There are, however, some rays of hope in all of this. The judiciary. <coughs> so private citizens in Kenya now have the right to sue the state. And a very interesting development quite recently one of the guys in one of the districts that I follow was, was one of these fellows who was qualified for the job to take over a ministerial position at the county level. And he was passed over. Other people who did not meet the minimal requirements were hired in favor of him. And he sued. He took the governor to court. And this has been a front page story because needless to say other governors are worried about it and other individuals in other uh, counties are thinking, gee, maybe I can do the same thing. Interesting story. The governor had one of his guys, gave him a million shillings and said, go defend the county in court. His guy went down to the high court, came back, said, he said Hi, you know, hire a lawyer and, and defend our county. The guy came back and said, lawyer's on the job, this case is going well, but I need more money for the lawyer. More money for the lawyer. The decision came down against the county. All of the administrators were sent home. It turned out, no honor among thieves, the governor's guy never hired a lawyer. So they never defended the county. The other development that I'm seeing on the ground is that the media are much more present in the counties. There's money there that attracts the media. So there's a lot more people looking around. I'm seeing a freer environment. <coughs> So, for example, uh, an MP very recently was caught by a local ward representative for having given out a tender without any um, competitive bidding. The issue wasn't so much that he was defending the right for competitive bidding, but rather because it was his ward, he should have been able to give out the contract. But this was talked about very openly in the district, even with the reason why the MP asked the community for forgiveness because this had been a major contributor to his campaign and therefore he needed to pay him back. So the good news here is not a question of you know, who gets to steal the rents, but the fact that the community is at least getting enlightened by how all of these things are operating. Meanwhile, the center is fighting back. There's talk of undoing the devolution and the decentralization, although I suspect that will be only with enormous great difficulty um, given how popular it is. There is also a crackdown on the media, a crackdown on civil society, uh, reminiscent of some of the old days in Kenya. That said, we can all watch this playing out live on Kenya TV. So while political pluralism is certainly favorable to exclusive politics. It's difficult to see how this situation is going to get from here to there. That said, we've got lots more centers now where the money has been devolved, and we have lots more people who know that they're losing out on jobs and contracts. How they get united and formed into some sort of viable opposition remains to be seen. And Duran makes the case 
that the devil is in the details trying to predict these things that hinge on these windows of opportunity and special moments is almost impossible. And I cannot predict for you how it's all going to come out. Well, thank you very much. So maybe we have a, a, a question from, from the microphone over here, please. Uh, hi, thank you very much. This topic is uh, very close to my heart. I'm a Fulbright student from Afghanistan. Um, I have two questions. First. Um, institutions means different things for different societies. Um, what do you mean by good institutions? What are, the good, what are the main features or characteristics of a good institution that could guarantee nations to succeed? Um, and, 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 and what, how do you measure inclusivity in, in institutions? Or the other way around? Um, because it really could mean different things in various contexts. Um, the second question, that I, 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 and, and, and just to add on, on the first one, what are the basic uh, institutions which is required to kick off that success in a nation? Uh, have you categorized that? that is there a categorization of basic institutions? The second question I have, it has to do with the, uh, the, with the legal um, blocks, building blocks of a successful nation. There's always a fear of over-regulation or having too many le uh, uh, legislations uh, not enforced uh, as opposed to um, less number of legislations uh, or deregulation or less number of legislations which cannot be enforced. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, since Yuriki was next on the list, she said she's volunteered to talk a little bit about the regulation question, then you can come back to the first question. Yeah, no, I think the, the first is very direct to Ron. Um, uh, very good point. Um, so so um, to kind of reformulate what you were saying is kind of while we are striving to come up with the optimal design of a legal rule uh, to kind of ensure the optimal decision making and the optimal equilibrium outcome, we might underestimate that, you know, that many aspects of overregulation, but we might over underestimate how difficult it is to process those, or how constrained people will be in their choices, or how people will not respond to rules. And I think this is a really important theme. It, you know, it, I think it doesn't, kind of this big question, so when do institutions work and don't work, and like, could it be that even inclusive institutions, which I import in some country might not apply, <coughs> kind of, one, that is not solved, but one aspect of it is that sometimes bringing in these legal rules just tend to do something, something very different. And so one aspect I've been very interested in is that I think we, um, and that's behavioral economics coming in here, is we might underestimate the power not only of past experiences, of culture and norms we're used to, but of simple behavioral facts like, for example, default effects. So, so I've you know, personally more done research on the you know, enrolling in a gym and as a default money is subtracted from your account and nevertheless you never go and lose a lot of money. But other people have applied it to 401k savings. Or more generally, whether or not you pay taxes. Or if you are a poor person, whether you take advantage of earned income tax credit. So the fact that little defaults, um, for example, in Germany, the default of you paying a church tax as a default if you're a member of, of, of a church, leads to that institution, the church, the Catholic church in particular, being very, very rich in Germany and others not, it seems to be kind of completely disjoint from just kind of looking at the rules and how difficult it is to, um, to, to opt in or out. And um, it also relates, I think, to um, topics which are very much current, for example, what does capitalism really mean in a country? What does, um, how does inequality evolve? If we were just looking at the legal rules, you know, the legal rules reigning corporations um, on corporate governance in Scandinavia versus other continental European countries versus the US, I would bet that in a kind of abstract room, we weren't able to predict how big the differences in inequality are, how much more um, the, the people running the organization are able to extract money, particularly if they had recent success as superstar CEOs, is, is, is one theme I've, 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 I've done research on, here as, as opposed to, to over there. So kind of the, the aspect of overregulation I want to draw kind of attention to is complexity. So people have limited ability to process uh, legal rules and how simple default effects may just kind of hinder these rules from, from being implemented. Wanna, I mean, I'm happy to take, but Bob yeah, yeah. might have 
Bob might have some. Yeah, I, I want to say wanna... I, I'll, I'll I'll be quick because time is um, uh, I know um, running quickly. Um, I, I I I've tried to make the point elsewhere. I'll make it again. I think um, those who work with legal institutions no better than those who observe them from afar, perhaps, but looking at the rules is the wrong way to look at the question. I think the important question is, what do the enforcing institutions do, right? So the fact that you have, and, and we, we are all familiar with famous studies which were um, uh, quite misleading, which uh, tried to figure out what the books say, that really is not the place to go, right? Where you want to look is to ask the question, what do the institutions that are actually enforcing the system that is in place do. And one of the things, just to engage uh, Duran a bit on that very uh, important question that he raised, uh, you, know, you, 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 you could ask this question. Well, could you have an extractive institution of the sort he describes so beautifully in his book that nonetheless has an effective legal system in that it is enforcing immoral, bad, or uh, unequal laws? And I, 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 my, my instinct is that the answer is no. Just as politics infects the legal system, the, vice, the reverse is equally true. And so that uh, uh, you, can, you can find examples all over the place. Take, uh, take Russia as a, as a prime example. Uh, there are lots of, of, of rules. We've had American lawyers and economists over there studying uh, the, the way in which the, the law and the books seems to comply beautifully with uh, all the norms that we hold dear. But as a matter of fact, uh, the courts are corrupt. The ju judiciary is not uh, independent. Arbitration doesn't work. Informal mechanisms don't work because the uh, norms that produce um, a positive sum outcomes are eroding. And uh, the legal system is, by any definition, failing. Um, uh, and, I, and I guess there may be counterexamples, but I would take the position that an extractive society almost by definition won't have an effective legal system, at least in the way I've tried to define it. So why don't we have a question from over here, and then we'll see yeah, thank uh, you. we'll open that up to anybody. Thank you. Oh, that's loud. Um, I run a, uh, an investment company that focuses on private investments in frontier markets and have done a bit of work in, uh, in development in, um, in some of these frontier markets for donor institutions. Uh, my question to the panel overall is uh, uh, is is around the the concept of democracy, um, and I'd ask, like to ask a couple uh, multi-part questions and that kind of go towards the the core of of one concept. Uh, the first is is a functioning democracy a necessary factor for a successful nation? Is a democracy right for some and not right for others? I'll cite Singapore or China um, as examples of countries that I would consider uh, re either very successful or marginally successful that have varying degrees of, of non-democratic non systems. Um, and another question is, is democracy an, an inevitable result of a nation's development? Or in 20 or 50 years or however timeline you'd like to see, will, there, will we find that non-democratic nations or non-democratic systems are more successful than those that are uh, democratic? And now the big one is, is it dangerous for a Western academic to say or imply that democracy doesn't work at all times for all people in all situations? Okay, Darren. Okay, I, let me actually quickly uh, say something in response to the first question, and then I'll say a few things about it. So I think in response to the first question, I just want to uh, elaborate on what Bob said, because I think Bob's answer sort of uh, uh, captures the way I think about it. I mean, in the sense that, you know, uh, the reason, you know, it's a strength and the weakness, weakness and the strength at some level, although it's all in the beauty of the, be uh, in the eye of the beholder, uh, that of, of our definitions of inclusive and extractive institutions, that they're not defined by some very specific uh, legal rules or constitutional things. It's, you're not going to make a society have inclusive, say, economic institutions by writing in the constitution that uh, the courts are going to be unbiased or property rights are, uh, uh, are sacred. And similarly, extractive institutions aren't all characterized by the same things. In fact, you know, part of the historical sort of sweep of the book is to start from extractive institutions based on slavery and come to places like Egypt under Mubarak or 
uh, Mexico under PRI or North Korea under the Kim family. You know, if you look at those societies, there is nothing in common between the details of certain institutional features. But at the end, we think that extractive economic institutions is a useful umbrella for thinking about these institutions because even though the details differ, the functions of how economic power and political power is organized in society has a lot of commonalities. In each case, uh, the economic rules, be it slavery, be it uh, contracts that are given to, uh, uh, to insiders of Mubarak's NDP party, uh, or, or, or the way that the uh, Juche system and communism in North Korea work, all of them have been tilted in a specific way to advantage a small group of individuals and at the expense of the rest of society. So that's the commonality between extractive institutions under these different circumstances. And similarly, same thing about inclusive institutions. So I think if you want to sort of think about inclusive institutions, it's not just what you put in the constitutions or what you declare as how the institutions work. On democracy, that's a very long question in the sense that to give the answer, so I'm just going to give a very snippet of it. But of course, this is going to reflect uh, my own views. You know, this draws some on some work that uh, I've been doing with uh, Suresh Naidu, who is sitting here. You know, uh, we, you know, first of all, we are very convinced, you know, rightly or wrongly, that political institu inclusive political institutions are central for economic development in the long run. Inclusive political institutions are more than democracy. You can have elections, but that's not going to make inclusive, uh, uh, inclusive political institutions. But democracy is necessary for it. You cannot have a dictatorship or a junta that's inclusive political institutions because that's going to distribute political power equally. So therefore, uh, it's an empirical question even if you believe our perspective what democracy does. But what we find is that despite all of the bad press that democracy gets, democracy tends to have, even with all of the imperfections that it has in the data, uh, in the way that we measure it, in the way that many democracies are not inclusive, democracies still have a fairly large positive effect on economic growth. And, and there, isn't, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that democracy is bad even for economies at low levels of development. So. Uh, that's at least our empirical evidence. On the other side of this coin, that's another topic that I've done a lot of research over the last 10 years or so, uh, despite the sort of some very famous hypothesis going back to Martin Seymour Lipset and other people on modernization theory, the empirical evidence doesn't support the idea that there is a natural path to democracy if you get richer. So, there, you know, of course, uh, democracy does require certain economic institutions to support it, but, you know, Russia can get as rich as it wants under, you know, a system based on oil and under the command of Putin and his cronies. That's not going to bring democracy anytime soon. Well, actually, we've, that's gone very quickly, an hour and a half. I really thank everybody for coming, and I think I learned a huge amount with this panel. So I'd like to thank your panelists, and thank you all for coming here. Thank you very much.